Welcome astrology lovers. It's so great to have you here. Welcome to Astrology Hub TV. My name is Amanda Poole Walsh and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Astrology Hub. And Astrology Hub TV is a weekly show dedicated to helping you explore your connection to the cosmos and how cultivating this connection can help you live a more empowered, fulfilling and vibrant life. We're here live every Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific 7 o'clock Eastern, except next week we will be live with Monique Lorink on Thursday, March 1st at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. So we're working with a global pool of astrologers and Monique is in France. And so we wanted to move it a little bit earlier for her so that she was not broadcasting at like 1 a.m., which is basically what Soul is doing right now, mm. <laughs> who's our guest today. Um, but so just mark your calendars for next week Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern for Monique Lorink. If you'd like to receive Facebook Messenger um, alerts from us every time that we go live, you can do so by signing up for live alerts. The link is in the chat and the link is above the description of this video. All right, so today we are live with evolutionary astrologer Sol Johansson and we are going to go deeper into the nodal axis so you can better understand how to interpret these stellar points in an astrology chart. In this episode, you're gonna learn why the nodal axis acts as the red thread of one's life, how planets on the nodal axis color the life expression, and what dynamics around the nodal axis can show up. So today's episode is for you if you're interested in a soul-based perspective of astrology and life. If you're eager to understand your inherited patterns and programming, and if you would like to understand where you've been from, where your soul has been from, and where your soul is going. Before we dive in with soul, I want to make sure you all know about a very special free opportunity that we have coming up here just starting next week. We are releasing a free mini training on astrology chart reading made easy. This is a three-part video series that we put together with astrologer Donna Woodwell. So for any of you that are interested in diving deeper into chart interpretation, understanding your own chart, understanding the charts of others, this is a free training experience that is available to you starting next Tuesday. You can sign up with the link in the chat and or in the description above this video, and we'd love to have you. All right. So telling you a little bit more about our guest today, Sol. Sol W. Johansson has been pursuing her love for astrology since her teens. Introduced to this fine art by her Aries father, who himself dabbled in astrology when she was little. Her preference in astrology is evolutionary astrology, as this offers a therapeutic and creative approach to the birth chart. She did her training with Maurice Fernandez, another astrology hub favorite astrologer and has had her mind on esoteric studies for 20 years. She's also certified soul flow therapist, meditation instructor, and an avid yogini. Soul, it is so great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. It's uh, wonderful to connect, especially with Hawaii. I have a special place in my heart for Hawaii, I must admit. Oh, nice. What islands have you been to? I've been to the Great Island. That's where they had astrology rising in 2011, and I um, I presented there. This yes. is Maurice's uh, little, you know, baby. This yes. astrology rising conference. Fantastic. So. All right. Well, um, yeah, Hawaii is a very magical place. Great no. place to look at the stars and look at the oh. sky. <laughs> we went up to this um, observatory, actually, that is 3,000 meters. I don't know if that's what we use in Europe, meters <laughs> above sea level. And I got to see uh, Jupiter through a telescope. And uh, I must admit, it was a very moving moment. I cried. It's wow. alive. You know, the planets are alive. We live in a, in a universe that is alive. And when you see it through a telescope like that, it, it really becomes a reality. It becomes something you can touch and you can feel it and you can really get a connection with life around us something that is not always available for us since we live under this constant light pollution that we do wow so that, that is so beautiful yeah really that was a gift um, yeah these mountains they're they're literally mountains the islands that we're on um they i think you're talking you're probably talking about mauna kea and Mauna Kea. yeah, yeah and it's it's i believe 
the tallest mountain if you take it from the bottom of the ocean to the top in the world. It is. So, yeah, it's very, very magical. Mm. Uh, so, Sol, you are an evolutionary astrologer. I would love for you to share with everybody who's tuned in. Welcome, everybody, by the way. Um, just share your definition of evolutionary astrology. What is evolutionary astrology? Well, evolutionary astrology takes seriously the fact that your birth chart is not random. It comes from somewhere. When you're born at a particular time in, 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 in life, it, there's a deeper dynamics that is the continuation of something that happened before your birth chart is not just random and it, as it stated one of the greatest sources of inspiration for evolutionary astrology and a book that most people read when they get into evolutionary astrology is the yogananda book and there it is stated if i'm not wrong it is stated that your birth time is auspicious it's created magically because that's the exact correct birth time for you to work with your karmic patterns etc so it's a deep spiritual approach to astrology that takes the soul seriously which i think is absolutely a natural thing to do unless you come from a more materialistic philosophical point of view where there's no soul but it really you know it takes seriously the fact that we live in this embodied in you know conscious universe and that um we're on a path we're all on this path of evolution there is a basic premise a natural law in everyone's lives and it's evolution and it's not just evolution on the physical level as we see through the species but it's also an evolution on a mental emotional spiritual level so that we can get to that point in our evolution where we can manifest our dharma which is the opposite point of karma and we can live out the plan of the soul we all have a special kind of meaning with why we are here and it doesn't not necessarily relate to your uh, career it can relate to some evolution uh, to your emotion for instance where you have to go through a certain kind of process and just by going through that process, you will feel you succeeded in something because you solved something that felt very, very old. So for me, it was natural to, to, to go into evolutionary astrology because I always had that kind of approach to life in general. I knew that that's why we are here. We're here to learn. We're here to explore. Um, and we're here to move away from the past and into the future. And no other astrology format has that particular definition so clearly expressed mm -hmm. as evolutionary astrology. And besides, there was the whole thing about the nodal axis that I was driven into because I really felt uh, something important here. So I actually found that at my own nodal return at 18. That's when I started exploring the nodal axis for, for real because I... There was no books practically about it. There was only this Martin Schulman book that I could get a hold of, and I needed more. So mm -hmm. I was very, very happy to find the Pluto books of Jeffrey Wolfgreen one day in a bookstore in Oslo. So wow. that was, yeah, that was about probably the first real books that I read about astrology. Mm. Okay, so we're going to spend most of our time talking about the nodal axis. It is pretty much one of the main things that you look at as an evolutionary astrologer, correct? Yeah, it was probably the first thing I start with. Uh, the, the, the formula for evolutionary astrology is very, very easy in a way. The South Node, if you know what that is, and I will show you after, if not. Uh, the South Node, Pluto and the Moon relates to the past, whereas uh, the Ascendant, uh, the North Node and the Sun relates to your future or your future expression. So it's all about integrating this duality of future and past. And, and, and you know, so that's how we look at, you know, that's how we approach, approach the chart. We're trying to understand the nodal axis. Okay. And how many of you out there, I just want to ask the audience a question about the nodal axis. How many of you know your north and south node? That's the first question. If you do, just go ahead and put it in the chat so we can, we can see. And then if you do know your, your nodal axis, do you know if you have any planets on the north or south node 
So, and if you do, just let us know about that too. And we'll, we'll take a look. But um, all right, so Sol, tell us, uh, let's go deeper into the nodal axis. Can you tell us why you call it the red thread of someone's life? Well, it's because it's basically, so the South Node and the North Node are basically related to this evolutionary path between the past and the future, between the karma and the dharma. So it will necessarily bring up some tendencies. If we just take the theory, the South Node, what we normally encounter in books is that the South Node is related to the past. It's a truth with some modifications. We, there are some you know, there will always be exceptions to that rule, for instance, if you have a lot of planets on the North Node. But generally speaking, the South Node embodies what we call a um, um, an identity. It's something that you already have inside of you. These are qualities and experiences, almost like a gene pool. And I, I, I like to compare it to um, my phone. When I buy a phone, there's some um, software on my phone that I can't get off. I can change some of the apps. I can take them on and off, you know, but there are some that I can't get away. You know, they're integrated into my hard drive. And this is basically what we mean when we have a, when we talk about the South. No, these are just comfort zones inside of us, tendencies. So they relate very much to what you're used to being with. So qualities that you're used to being with. So when we look at that, from that, that means it takes up a lot of space, right? It takes up a lot of space. So we look at that in combination with Pluto and the Moon, you get a very rich picture of what is this person's particular path of least resistance. What is this person's subconscious tendencies that uh, are created through aeons or, you know, many lives of did you, did you just say in combination with pluto or did, did yeah, I, yeah, the, okay. yeah, the, the south node pluto and the moon is related right as the, the north node the ascendant and the and the, the sun okay yeah because i want to make sure i heard you right yeah in an eclipse we just came out of two intense eclipses right and it's always related the eclipses are always related to the sun and the moon so it's always related to the sun and the moon in its basic archetypal nature. Mm. So, oh. you know, that's, that's exactly what it's all about, right? So these comfort zones, these, um, path, the path of least resistance is very easy to just follow. You know, it's like throwing a, it's like sending a ball down hills. Doesn't take any effort, right? But if you want to push it upwards, you have to go through some will exertion of will you have to know what you're doing you have to want it there's a conscious creation happening there so it's really coming out of the subconscious reactions the just path of least resistance our comfort zones and going into a more conscious creative expression where we are more fully engaging with our own uh, destiny mm. yeah and, and so that's what you mean by the red thread now it, it one one I think potential misconception at least I know I had when I first started learning about the nodal axis is the idea that and maybe this isn't a misconception but if you can speak to it that'd be great that the south node is something that you're kind of I, I interpret it as something that you were moving away from whereas the north mm -hmm. node is something you're moving into but I later learned that it's more that the south node is something that you're integrating the north node and the south node it's not that you're like getting rid of your south node tendencies and that that would actually be sort of impossible like you just said with the phone that, you yeah, know, well, yeah, yeah you just have to learn to use it well and consciously that's the point i mean i i you've been thinking a lot about this you see you, you have to when you study these things and you use them in your astrology so what i often feel you know every archetypal expression every sign has its own uh dark side and its own bright side or there's a spectrum it goes from the the, the subconscious from the unconscious to the very conscious expression every 
sign does that you know that there's a spectrum and what i often feel with the south node that we need to purify a little bit of this expression like we need to take it up to a new level we have to integrate it in a more conscious way it depends on the dynamics around the uh, nodal axis of course some people might have a very strong evolutionary pressure on the nodal axis and then there's really a need to work on it while others have more smooth flowing kind of experience of their own nodal axis so this is a little individual of course but i feel you know that mostly and generally speaking i think we are dealing with the integration of a duality we cannot never get rid of anything in our charge where we can learn to use it in a more creative way we can't just get rid of a, a nasty pluto mars square for instance even though it causes us a lot of problems but we have to use it well. So this is the this is the idea. And of course, there are always these superficial, yeah, just move away from your south node. That will never make anyone happy. You just because the south node can also be the place where you have a lot of talents, where you already know a lot of stuff, where you already have the gift, right? So it's just that, you know, depending on the dynamics around the south node, you might have some issues to resolve there, right? And this is when we get into the rulers, etc. It gets a little bit more complicated, and 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 you know we easily get lost in this Virgo overanalyzing thing. But you know, basic rules is always that it's always an integration point. We have to learn to balance this duality. Mm. So tell us about the North Node then. Well, do you want? I have some slides I can show. Do you want me to show yeah, you? Yeah, that slides? would be. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Let me find them. I prepared some slides here so we show up. Now, slideshow. I'm not sure if I can do this. All right. Well, I'm sorry. It just came right. Here's the nodal axis. As you can see, it's physically speaking. You know, it's nice to have a, a physical kind of impression. What are we talking about? We're talking about the moon's journey around the Earth, crossing what we call the ecliptic, which is actually the sun's journey around the earth seen from a geocentric point of view. So these cross points, a node means a cross point, it is where the eclipses happen and that's where this kind of, um, in, this is where the nodes are. And they spend 18 months in each sign. Now we're in the middle of the nodal axis, the south node in Aquarius and the north node in Leo. And we recently just, you know, have two great eclipses on this particular uh, axis, one new moon and one full moon. And it shows a point where the energy of this particular, whatever planets are on this, it's being transmitted very easily into the atmosphere or the aura, if you like, of Earth. So anything that touches the nodal axis, it's like a portal. It just it flows into Earth. And if you have, you know, that's why it's so sensitive. Any transit to your nodal axis, anything happening around your nodal axis, any nodal return, it will have great um, impact in your life. You will really feel it. Something new is happening. Something old is releasing. There's this feeling of evolution when that happens in your own life because of this transmission into what is the the core, Earth, this is you. you. You are the Earthling, right? So there's this intensification of any planetary principle that touches the nodal axis. Now, this is, we can start with the South Node, for instance, because I have, this is the glyph for the South Node. It, it's like a little cup. And I like this little cup thing. It, it shows that there's something here that is like containing something. It already contains something. We say when the cup is full, it runneth over. And, and you know, it already contains something. And as I mentioned, it's, it can be your talents. It can be your shadows. It can be your past life experiences, your patterns, your complexes. It relates to your basic identity, how you feel in your core. And it's, it's both positive and negative. So it would be a very stupid thing to let go of the qualities of the South Node. But just elevate it. Take it up to a deeper experience to a higher expression. And there's a meaning why you were born with these nodes. And it is that this higher expression will be achieved when the north node, which has this glyph, is integrated, right? 
And that's when we go out of the comfort zone. I mean, most people enjoy being in the comfort zone. It's familiar grounds for us. We like to be uh, safe on earth. And I, 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 this is something that I resonate very strongly with because what I normally use as an thought experiment for people in order for them to understand existential stress is just that being on earth on the third rock from the sun in a universe, we don't know where we are. We have no idea what life is and we are, we know we're going to die, but we don't know what death is even, right? So we're, we're a little lost. We're trying to figure it all out. So going out of the rules, out of the regulations, out of what we are used to is not something that we necessarily do voluntarily. Now, thankfully, due to strong transits, etc., and you probably, some of you might have already noticed that if you had Uranus transiting any of these points or Pluto squaring it or anything happening on the nodal axis, you're being pushed forward in your life towards something unknown, something you haven't explored before. And that's when we all become babies. We don't know. So we just have to figure it out. But we're reaching a new potential. We're reaching a new expression. Now, you will see, let's say the south node is in, in Taurus. Just as an example, Taurus, what would that be? Taurus would be, um, Taurus is the farmer. It's the one who's always getting up at the same time every day, who, who needs that kind of comfortable rhythm. You know, it's very independent. The comfort zone is being alone, for instance. It's a um, soul who's used to doing a lot of things um, themselves. You know, the farmer, you know, it's, it's the farmer, he goes out on the field every day to, to water and to, to nourish the plants. So this need for a very stable, uninterrupted life might be what anyone with Taurus South Node needs, or that's the comfort zone. And there comes the Scorpio North Node because it's that's the opposite. And then you have like these deep emotional confrontations with people. You have intensity happening. You have drama happening. You have emotions happening. And then people are realizing, oh, that's stressful. It's ruining my stability. It's ruining my Taurus South Node thing. But I have to learn to deal with it because I can't get away from it. I try to chop off this thing, but it doesn't work, right? So I have to figure out how I can be intimate with life and have some sort of exchange, which is the essence of, of Scorpio. Like I need to grow as well. If I'm only alone doing my thing and I never talk with anyone or I never allow them to have any influence on me, I will never grow. Growth is the, 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 the fountainhead of Scorpio. We need to transform and grow. It's, it's definitely what it yearns for more. Whereas, you know, the Taurus South Node can be a little complacent and just be happy with what is. And as long as there's enough of what you need and your basic needs are met, why bother to go into the confrontation and the drama? So this is when you start to understand that these two, they start to work on each other they start to challenge each other they start to develop a conscious expression about both ends of it so that's exactly how um how we see the north node uh, and the south node in, in practical terms right mm. beautiful okay and then how about how planets on the nodal axis color the expression yeah there are two things you know the first is the rulers of the nodal axis, these are very important. This is the first thing when you start studying the nodal axis, you go to any textbook on the nodal axis, you will see where's the rulers? What are the rulers doing? And uh, we can look at a chart for the rulers. Let's see here. I have a good chart for the rulers. I'm sorry, like this is Madonna. This is actually a good, uh, you know, um, chart for the rulers. Oops, sorry. What happened? Yeah. All right. So they condition the evolutionary process. They sort of um, help the person forward, right? They, they, the, the rulers are, are co-pilots of the evolution of the, of the nodal axis. You see, I'm trying to figure out if I have some sort of pen here, but I, I don't think I have. You can see Madonna's... Actually, when you move your cursor, we uh -huh. can see... 
Oh, I can see. Oh, yeah, right. Because I'm on a personal computer and not my beloved Mac because it died when Mercury went into Pisces. So, okay. Oh, I miss it so much. This is my son's computer and it's a personal computer, but okay. I think All we right. can see, like, wait, if, if, will you move your cursor around? I want to see if we can see it. Yeah, okay. Let's see. All right. Can you see that? Are you trying to point at something? I'm, I'm pointing at the south node there. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We can see it. Yeah. All right. Good, good. Pointer, pointer options. Laser pointer. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Can you see? Okay. Yeah. Laser yeah. Pointer. That's great. <laughs> okay. So her south node is in Aries, right? And we know Madonna to be quite a fierce woman. She's, she's also, I mean, she's Leo course and Pluto conjunct the sun she's, she's massively she's powerful right in her own being and normally we translate the south node in Aries to be extremely independent very it's a warrior kind of energy she's used to fighting and we know from her life because she has a pretty well-known biography that she yeah she stood up for her rights she said papa don't preach she did all these things she stood up she's a feminist right she she said express yourself and 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 erotica this particular album that she gave out she was very very controversial in her times and being you know very uh, a young girl when this came out i would my whole generation was uh, influenced by it, the whole generation of women on earth. And this is exactly how we would interpret the South Node in Aries. It's the fighter, it's the activist, it's the individualist, it's the one who comes in with, with you know, a woman with a plan. Uh, you know, she, she's on a mission of some sorts. And the ruler of her South Node is not related to her nodal axis, but it's very, very um, evident uh, in this chart, if you ask me, because it's in Taurus, which is another extremely independent sign. It's autonomy. Taurus is territory. It's my territory. This is my expression. If you meet somebody with Taurus Mars, you will meet somebody who's extremely stubborn in their expression. They just want to eat food that they like to eat. They're, they're not wasting time on things that they don't love. Huh? So it's it's really like you could see she comes from a lot of willpower, strong willpower, very stubborn expression. But the ruler of her north node, which is you see her north node over here is in Libra um, in the second house, uh, which is also interesting because she really earned a lot of money. Um, it is it squares. We have a Venus Neptune square here. And. You know, Jupiter is on the North Node as well. And, you know, coming from this kind of isolated me, I know, being alone, she lost her mother. You see that eighth house South Node, she, she had this abandonment problem happening at a very early, young age. And, you know, it naturally isolated some part of her. You know, she managed alone. She had to be alone. And she was only, always solo. You know, Madonna was not Madonna and the crew. She was just Madonna, right? But eventually, you know, she was yearning to have an experience of relationships. She was yearning to have a, a, a kind of union with someone. And, you know, her, her love life, not that I know so much about it because I haven't inquired deeply and it's private for her but you could see that there might be some issues with her love life like she's flip-flopping between being this strong independent woman and falling in love and losing quite a bit of herself in that process so this is kind of like this is the dilemma of this south node in Aries where you're trying Aries is not a very um it's a very fragile sign in many ways because it's just a little it's just a little seed it barely touched ground and you can easily kill it by plucking it up you know it's the first sign of the zodiac it's the first fire sign fire is enthusiasm it's conviction but in Aries, you can easily deflate that conviction you can easily kill it so the spirit can easily be killed right so her even though she's she's a showing to the world that she, apparently she's very self-confident and strong in herself, you can also see that she might have that kind of appear, appearance because she's actually a little bit defensive about protecting her identity. She's actually trying to find it in a way. Jen? Yeah? 
but she's not. Sh she shows that she has a definition, and she has a definition due to that Mars and Taurus. She can be very defined, but she's also this South Node in Aries. She can also be a little insecure, and I think you know that's why she's been experimenting so much, going a little back and forth, going into the polarities which we see in in Libra, like. I'm going a little bit, I'm exploring this expression, and then I'm doing a little bit of this Ashtanga yoga, Kabbalah thing, and then I'm going back to this SM thing. <laughs> and like, um, I'm doing a little bit of everything. I'm, I'm trying to find myself. That's exactly through her own uh, creative, um, you know, enterprise. Uh, but you can also, you know, I would definitely, if I did Madonna's chart and Madonna suddenly turn up in my client file, I would definitely talk to her about this Venus Neptune square and say that, okay, babe, it's time to, to maintain some healthy boundaries in relationship. You know, you have to uh, see if you can find the golden middle point and, and you know, um, and, and move beyond some of your um, fantasies and expectations about love, right? So it's a very strong nodal axis uh, rulers, uh, you can see from the chart, um, definitely. Now, um, we have also another guy, which I think is very interesting, right? Because he has like two planets, both on the North Node and the South Node. And you said, okay, so what about planets on the nodal axis? Now, he has a Sun-Neptune opposition. This is Russell Brand, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, forgot to introduce him. I thought it was evident for you that this was Russell Brand's chart. Everybody knows that, right? Russell Brand is the, the, the comedian um, slash ex-drug addict who came out into the world with a bang. And he's been, he has his truths, this, this podcast online. He's highly engaged into politics. He's really... Um, working to create new consciousness he's got this he's he, he's really a man on a mission and you can see how incredibly you know strong his persona is with the sun on the south node this is a signature you find with very many strong leaders extremely people who easily get into fame for instance like whoops there i got a lot of attention that's like that's that's my comfort zone i'm happy with it. attention he can talk like on, spontaneously for hours on extremely quickly on subjects that are highly advanced you know he has a great vocabulary he is just incredibly intelligent and you see the south node in, in Gemini conjunct the, uh, the sun in Gemini and also the ruler Mercury which is retrograde in Gemini shows that he comes in with some particular talents when it comes to verbalizing himself He's just good with it. He, he knows. He's used his mind for many, many lives. He knows how to see things. You often find that with Mercury Retrograde, which is the ruler of this particular South Node, that these are people who think for themselves. Now, the opposition to the North Node, however, what do you want when you get out of your mind? To get out of your mind, huh? because if you are like a super Gemini, you think 24-7. It's a lot of nervous energy, mental energy. And he also has a very deep need for freedom. You, we know now that he replaced drugs with meditation and yoga, and he spent a lot of time in the East. He got married in the East. He got married in India, for instance. The South Node, no, the North Node in, in Sagittarius. Sagittarius is wild. He wants to go a little wild. He wants to be free. He wants to explore some authentic expression. South Node in, in Gemini is extremely aware of how other people think, can have some social anxieties, mind mapping people. It's all about surviving and knowing how people think and, you know, always being a little bit on the guard, you know, like, what's that? What's that? You know, being extremely reactive towards the environment. Whereas Sagittarius is like, I don't give a, you know, ah, I couldn't care less, you know. And if you want to be careless and not give a, mm, People do drugs, right? And that's what he ended up with. Escapism is often something we associate Neptune, which is the planet that he has on the North Node. So you see that, you know, his drug addiction, sun Neptune opposition, no boundaries, no nothing, you know, like he went into heroin. He just wanted to go into oblivion. That's what he was needing in order to get away from some of these very, very mental energies. And I think, you know, it's, it's a wonderful example of someone who is really trying to master this balance between the mind and fire, between, you know, like 
air, the mind, and then fire, just being, pure being. You can just shut up now, Russell, and you can just enjoy having some fun, play with it, right? And that's, you know, when you don't have that kind of freedom to do that, of course, you will need some substances. It's like a self-medication thing. He also had a lot of other difficult uh, aspects relating to his upbringing. You see uh, Mars uh, uh, the moon conjunction. So he had a lot of uh, things happening in his early uh, years that was, you know, kind of challenging, disruptive, didn't exactly give him a sense of security on an emotional level. Um, so he really needed to integrate uh, this um, this into his life as well. And he found his way. And he, you know, the funny thing is that he wrote a piece called The Messiah Complex. And The Messiah Complex, like, we often say that salvation and being a martyr is part of the sun Neptune opposition. You're here to save someone, right? You're here to kind of um, yeah, martyr yourself for the higher truth. Or and he's done that occasionally. Like, did I go too far? Like, did I? Did I? I mean, there's a lack of boundaries there for good and bad. Sometimes that's a good thing, right? Sometimes it can be a bad thing because he could easily shoot himself in the foot and destroy his career. And he's been on the verge of doing that quite a few times by crashing some important event by saying something outrageous or, you know, by challenging all the right people because he was just following his own flow and he had no idea when to stop and he was trying to save the world, etc. He's done a lot of good jobs of work for people with drug addiction, creating awareness around this. So he's definitely doing this in a much more constructive way now as he matures, as he grows older. But in the beginning, oh my God, there was a big flip-flop between the nodal axis here. There's a big clown syndrome in this kind of energy as well. You know, he was probably, yeah, spending a lot of time, um, wasting a lot of time. Huh? So it's so very... Uh, a couple questions this yeah. from, from the audience. Um, yep. Susan wants to know what orb degrees do you use for conjunction? Oh, I'm so generous with orbs, you know, evolutionary <laughs> astrology. Yeah, we are. Evolutionary astrology is, you know, it's, it's you know, it has some relation to what, what we know as archetypal astrology. And if you read a little bit of Richard Tarnas, you would know that he uses extremely generous orbs. It's like 10 degrees. And here you can see there's 12 degrees between the south node and, uh, and um, Russell's sun. And there's a 10 degree orb between um, the north node and Neptune. So yeah, all right. You might call me a little too optimistic in terms of calling it a conjunction. I, I, you know, for me, it's a conjunction. I would definitely read it as a conjunction, mostly because it's in the same sign. The thing would be very different if it was in different signs, because same sign, same energy, you know? Same sign, same energy. We are just, we're talking energy here. We're not talking orbs. Now, the closer the orb, the tighter the orb, let's say the sun was one degree and the south node was zero degrees, it gets more intense, right? It might be even more difficult to resolve or it might be even more intense in some ways. Like we can look at one chart that has a very strong conjunction between the south node and, um, and a planet, and that's uh, Robin Williams. And it's Venus in, um, in Virgo conjunct the south node in Virgo. And it is extremely strong. You might say that it's taking a little bit over. In, in, in all astrology, we would say, you know, the strongest aspect you have is worth looking at, especially if it's angular. Now, in evolutionary astrology, we're completely crazy about angular aspects. And the angular aspects are the conjunctions, the squares, and the oppositions. These are the major evolutionary aspects because they are all related to the grand square and the grand square is related to formation of matter it's actually creative it's creating something whereas a trine would be more flowing and perhaps even more passive there's no evolutionary tension in it and from physics we know that if you have resistance in any electrical current you will get a stronger electrical current. And that's how you can translate these more um, angular aspects. They are much stronger. So 
the conjunction to the South Node here in this particular moment. You know, I remember Robin Williams as somebody, oh, I actually said this on a lecture once, everybody loves Robin Williams, I said. And then there was somebody in the audience who said, no, not everybody. <laughs> she was the one being in Virgo voice in there. She's like, maybe she didn't like him. But he's very lovable. He was very lovable. It, of course, he was cancer. So when every time a cancer nation like uh, the United States loses one of these cancer people, like you have uh, Meryl Streep or you have Tom Hanks, for instance, it's like cancer actors. It's like a national grief day because they, it was just we, they, it's their home in this energy, right? This the United States energy. So, but he's very Venus on the South Node. And if you, I once saw an impro show on him where he's showing off his Venus in Virgo and how incredibly talented it is. This is bringing in talent. You know, Venus can be artistic talent that is like a residue from a past life. This is just automatic for him. Other people might not understand. He was a genius, right? And other people might not understand where does it take it from? I saw this impro show where he did like a whole set just with a scarf. Like he was three, I think it was like uh, 10 different nationalities and personas just with, you know, putting the scarf in different, like suddenly he was a little old wife and then he was this diva and then he was like whatever he did with the scarf it, you know it, it sort of inspired him to do a different character it was absolutely brilliant and then I then you can see how incredibly talented he was so this is a very strong Venus but he's also extremely self-critical and Virgo can be a, very afraid of um, exposure if you have a strong Virgo signature, you don't want to have your secrets revealed because that might show the world that you're not a perfect human being. Now, there's a reason why he killed himself, and that was because he didn't want to go through that humiliating experience of being that diseased, crippled thing, right? That he could have been if the disease would have further, you know, evolved, and it would have, yeah? So, you know, his control freak probably stressed out completely and 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 he, he he thought it was a better thing to 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 just kill himself he wouldn't go through that kind of humiliation so letting go of control letting go and just opening up to the adventure now thankfully he has also the moon like people who have the moon on the nodal axis are often very easy to love they're moony. They're like extremely empathic, extremely sweet, and it's the ruler of his son, etc. So you see how strong his persona becomes with this particular uh, lunar action because it's he's embodying this Virgo Pisces qualities that one Virgo with all the skills, with all the talents, and then he also has this ability to just free, free flow, jam. The guy was a master improviser, right? He could just, and that's Pisces. It's just, I'm just going to jump on this wave and I'm going to surf it. So I'm just going to move with the flow, right? And this was one of his gifts. And it's, I personally find it very hard not to love him, even at his, you know, <laughs> even at his worst. But he also had a drug problem, right? As many in the business do, you know, he, he loved cocaine, for instance, and you love drinking. And he also had that escapist tendency that comes, as we saw with Russell Brand and his Neptune on the North Node. He also had Pisces North Node is the same energy, right? So he also had that tendency to want to disappear, to not want to confront, to not want to, yeah, face, face something. Right? So it's interesting. And see if we have something else. Um, here's another woman with a very powerful nodal axis. Now, Oprah recently made, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, she was recently uh, crowned the president of the United States uh, as of 2020. I mean, she's already elected. If we are going into the collective, uh, you know, consciousness, uh, there's a lot of people who would really like to see her be the queen of the show um, the next uh, presidential round. And hey, so, so before yeah. you move on completely, um, yeah. can we just answer one question? Of course. Okay. So from Laura, what can we say about Robin's nodal conjunctions being in different houses? 
Ah, uh, good question. Well, again, we come back to the, the, the what I find a little complicated. If I want to go, it's ooh, that's like a three-hour class. Okay. Like, yeah, because the node. What are the house system? Which house system is really used? Right. That was another question that people were asking. Well, if for this particular um, um, uh, charts, I use Koch, okay. uh, which is like it's very similar to Porphyry. It's not as it's not as deviant as the Placidus. Placidus often have these great big houses and then these very, very small houses. <clears throat> Depending on where you're born, of course, the closer to the equator, the more equal your houses will be, right? If you live as me in Norway, if you go up above 66 degrees north, the house system collapses. So that forced me to think a little bit about the house systems. And, and uh, I normally say the only quarrel we have in this house is the house system quarrel because I, you know, <laughs> it's what we fight about in our house not what we're gonna have for dinner so <clears throat> the house system is it's very hot potato in the astrology thing and i think you know it's an esoteric line i think it's there as it is because that forces us to think so i don't have an opinion about his you know like i i can of course interpret it it's like like a sliding transition between these two like a connecting tissue between these two houses is yeah but i can also um uh, what i've been exploring lately and i think i will start using publicly is the whole sign houses the archetypal model like just go for something that is more neutral and it's based on the zero zero points um because I find that it makes a lot of sense. Same sign, same energy. If you have a transit, so even if you have, let's say, uh, let's say you have Pluto. No, let's say you have Jupiter in Capricorn in the second house, but your first house begins with Capricorn. You have also Capricorn in the first house. So in 2008, you had a whole thing happening in Capricorn. Pluto entered into Capricorn, and suddenly all these second house, first house, you know, second house issues started to really come into the surface because your solar second house would be all Capricorn if the Sagittarius ascendant defines the first house. So we can just look at the transits and then feel in if you have a transit happening in the seventh house and it goes into a new sign and it starts affecting your eighth house business, you know that perhaps, okay, there is like a connection between that sign in the seventh house and the eighth house. Maybe whole sign houses would be better to use. I don't know. So that's a, that's a difficult question to answer very clearly, to be quite honest. Yeah. Okay. All right. Back to Oprah. Yes. Back to Oprah. Let's <laughs> go into Oprah. Where are you, darling? There she was. Yeah. Oprah is, um, yeah, as we will see, Pluto will enter. This is a digression, of course, but she will soon have Pluto on the North Node. So we can all get an opportunity to study what does that mean because there's going to be some huge transformations in her life, for sure. But I love this chart in terms of understanding the nodal axis because it's so potent. Um, she has a planet squaring the nodal axis, which is also incredibly important because it relates to the angular aspects. There is something in evolutionary astrology we call the skipped step, which means this is a planetary principle that is needing more integration, conscious integration into one's personal life. <clears throat> now, she has Chiron on the north node and Uranus on the south node. Uranus is the ruler of her son, Venus conjunction in Aquarius. So she knows how to use and talk to groups. She's an incredible media, uh, you know, giant. She, and, and Uranus is related to technology. It's related to uh, communication. It's related to, in particular, television and all kinds of um you know, it's not necessarily the words we speak mouth to mouth, which is more Gemini. It's more the, the, the all these other forms of communication, like the internet, for instance. It's like global communication and it's group communication where you're not talking to one person, you're talking to a group of people. 
this is the group orientation that lies deep into the consciousness of anyone who has a strong Uranus. They just know that. They know how to talk to, to groups of people. And she's definitely um, gathered new groups. I mean, she's, she's, she's uh, her whole career in media, what has the Oprah universe been about? It's been about uh, progress, change, revolution, how to revolutionize your life, how to, you know, how to become a, a new and better and improved version of yourself. Uranus always wants to, you know, to, to explore how to become, uh, how to get into the future. And when she first started her uh, interviews with Eckhart Tolle or all these people that she, she's had on her show, it's always about exploring this a lot of, you know, what makes us happy, what do we need, how, I mean, what is life, all these kinds of higher mind questions in a way, you know, get, reaching a new awareness and consciousness. And how we translate Uranus on the, on the South Node is that uh, she already comes in with a lot of intelligence. She's extremely intelligent. She, she needs, in a way, to find in her own life as well, because we've seen that she had personal struggles, right? With her weight issues. And, you know, there's a lot of this outsider energy. She came from incredible disruptive childhood. Uranus on the South Node can often show that people, there's a lot of chaos. You come in with a lot of emotional chaos. There's a lot of emotional instability, mostly because it's in cancer, right? There's this, this association between the mind and the emotions. And we know that she had a few traumas growing up as well that related to sexual abuse and she had like a, a miscarriage, etc. So there's this kind of energy in her chart that shows that she's a little ruthless, she's a little without identity, she's a little searching for higher knowledge and she's incredibly intelligent. And then she has Chiron, the so-called wounded healer on the North Node. Chiron is also, if we ask Melanie Reinhardt, which is like, the Chiron expert. It's also the shaman. It's the <clears throat> it's the teacher. It's the healer. It's the um, it's the guru. Actually, that's how far she goes in her um, interpretation of Chiron. I think it's a very interesting interpretation because Chiron himself was a healer teacher. Uh, although wounded, he was um, absolutely capable of providing answers and healing to other people. So it's uh, through his own wounds, he gained a lot of wisdom and knowledge. And this is exactly the way that I see Oprah also did in her life. I mean, her path is our path in a way, you know? It's like, yeah, she's showing us that, okay, I'm Oprah, but I also have stuff to work with, right? And it's a kind of, I think I always found that very flattering with her. I think it's very, like, even though, I mean, she's a media mogul, she's also, you know, can be some cynicism in that, right? But still, I mean, she's um, at least showing um, that, you know, healing is important. We all need this kind of healing. And, and she's also showing us that, you know, she's a teacher for humanity in many ways. Um, although for some she, she's just talking to the basic consensus population, she's still she's still showing the way, right? So she's a real innov um, innovator. Mm, yeah, so it's definitely an interesting chart. Yes, you see how powerful it is, huh? Absolutely. So can we take one more question because we're running out of time? Well, is there anything else you wanted to cover before? No, I, no, I think. I, I don't think so. I think we saw a little bit of, we scraped the surface. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. It's like the very, very tip of the iceberg, but it's good because a lot of people out there maybe don't know about evolutionary astrology and about the nodal axis and can now start to go down that path and explore it further. Oh, so they can explore their own charts. And like exactly. About it. like it's so exactly. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. So questions, bring them on. Okay. Yeah. So one is, um, can you talk about transiting nodes, conjuncting natal nodes? Oh, that's interesting. Yes, as I told you, I, I discovered the nodes when I was 18 myself, and I had the first nodal return. These are, you know, as it takes about 18 months for them to go through one sign, it takes a full 18 years and some months to go through a full cycle. And then, you know, you can just 
cut that in two and you get these nine year old cycles, four and a half year, nine years, you know, we, we are counting the, the, the squares and the oppositions. Now we, we have two, two, we have nodal return, which is when the nodals return to where they were at when you were born. And then we have the um, opposite um, um, nodal um, exploration when, when the south node is conjunct the north node and the north node is conjunct the south node. Yes. So, yes. What happens then? Oh, um, I can use my own chart as an example. When I was 18, I was in Paris and I have the south node in Gemini and often the south node in Gemini people, they have this vast knowledge of the multitude of life inside of their hard drive. It's just the software. I know that not every culture is the same. This is like the Gemini approach. Everything is relative. Uh, being a woman in Africa is not the same as being a woman in Europe, for instance. You know, like we have different truths. This is like one of the things with Gemini South Node. I was exposed to so many different cultures. I came from this little country in the north where we had like, there was, I remember there was one Pakistani in my village, you know, like, God, not a lot of influence from the multicultural world, right? And when I went there to Paris and I started working for Parisians and I had all these experiences with Portuguese and French people and Italian people and whatever you have, you know, like everything under the sun. I had a cultural experience that opened up some incredible um, understanding of who I am. So when you have a nodal return like that, you get in touch with who you really are. A lot of people start exploring their true selves at this point. A lot of people become extremely uh, tired and fatigued by their, um, their chosen path, like their school they're attending, etc. They get a little urge to just have a year off and explore something, backpacking or whatever, you know, it depends on the energy of the nodal axis. But you get a chance to really deepen the relationship to yourself. And it's the same with the reverse node of return when the north node and south node come together. It's this incredible ex uh, you know, experience that your, your life is moving forward. You're, you're exploring this newness. But you also have to deal with some karma, some what I call a karmic burp. There is something just burping up from the certain, <laughs> like, oi, oh, look at that. You meet people. That's very important. The nodal axis is very, very often related to people you meet in synastry, which we haven't covered. If you have crisscross points between your chart and somebody's nodal axis, you're going to feel, hey, man, where did I see you before? You're very familiar. I know I've seen you before. And you can have that great, like, intense encounter with somebody that's like oh, i just know you and then after some something else comes like that well, it depends on what you have around your nodal axis and if you're pluto squaring it it might not be so nice this encounter after a while you might find oh it's a little bit more than i bargained for okay well <laughs> let's just go with it and see where it ends because it's definitely transformative. It's definitely going to change you forever. You're going to see yourself through this other one. You're going to see, I know you. Now I know where I've been. So mm -hmm. a lot of incredible encounters with other people happen during these nodal uh, um, returns and reverse nodal returns. You just find something, and a piece of the puzzle that you didn't even know you were looking for. So it's an amazing time for a lot of people, like a real emotional maturation. It's also a time where you can really see that, okay, so this is what I'm working on, right? These are the patterns that keep coming over and over and over again. And I'm like, that's what I mean with the red thread. This is like something you can't escape. It's like that repetitive pattern that just keeps happening all over and over again, because that's the path you were used to walking and then you get a chance to release it or transform it or take it to the next level yeah when you have mm -hmm. the things happening around your nodal axis and the same goes for transits around your nodal axis mm. so thank you so much you are reminding me of you know i have my master's in psychology and mm -hmm everything that you speak about the richness the nuances the the depth the complexity all of it is is really what i was searching for when i went for that degree you yeah. know how, years yeah. ago 
And then when I had my very first astrology reading, it was from Natasha Alter, an evolutionary astrologer. And I remember just going, oh my God, this is what I was after. This is what I wanted to understand. So you're just, you're reminding me of that. Just this ability uh, with this approach to astrology to, to understand some of the key, big, huge life questions and the things that we're all working through. So I appreciate it so much. And I'm sure many people in the audience do as well. So if people are interested in learning more about you and your work, where would they find you? I have a, I have a PowerPoint for that too as well. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. laughs> Thank you for the preparation. Ah, look at there. Uh, my name is Jonathan. It's a very... Jonathan. I've been saying Joe Hansen. I'm so sorry. Well, maybe I should try. I mean, it's like Scarlett Johansson. Maybe I should change it. It's more <laughs> compatible to the English language. Who ever heard of Jonathan anyway? I mean, yeah. it's just, so, you know, like my name is impossible. I just gave it up. And my, my middle name is the soul with, as you can see in my, my, uh, my web address there, which is even more impossible because it's an actual word in English. But it so is it's with? Your middle name is with? Yeah, but I can't wow. use it. <laughs> it's impossible. So that's where you can find me. W soul, you know, with dot com. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. And thank you for writing that out. And I'm very sorry for butchering your name this whole entire no, no, time. No, no, no. Don't worry. <laughs> Everybody does it. I'm so used to it. I'm I'm considered changing it. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm glad it's not just me. All right. And so thank you. So anybody who would like to explore uh, more of Soul's work, you can go to soul dash with Dot com. And then if you are interested, so you're sitting here and you're listening to Soul Talk, you're listening to this, the astrologers that come on every week, speak about things, you know, they're looking at the conjunctions, they're looking at the rulers of the planets and all these things, and you're getting some of it, but not all of it. And you want to know more, you want to become more astrologically literate. Mm-hmm. If that's you, please join us for our free mini training series that's starting next week. It's taught by Donna Woodwell. The thing that I love about Donna and the way that she teaches is that she's giving you a foundation. She's giving the, the nuts and bolts that you will need to put together so that if you want to go down the evolutionary astrology track at some point, you can. If you want to go down the Vedic uh, you know, path at some point, you can. You'll have the basic grammatical underpinning of astrology, the language, so that you can literally go down any path that you want. So if you would like to do that and you are eager to learn more, and even if you have already learned from other teachers, but you want to go back to the basics and make sure that you have the most solid foundation possible, Donna is amazing at that. So uh, again, that free mini training is happening next week. And after that mini training series, you'll be able to go even deeper if that's if that's the path that you want to go down. So that's available next week. Please sign up in the chat and or in the description of this video. The link is there. Um, invite your friends, anyone else who's interested in learning astrology. It will be starting next week. We'll send out the first video and then the, uh, the next two videos in the series will c- be coming out the following week. So excited to hear all of your feedback on that. It was amazing. Um, so much fun to put together. I learned so much just in the process of putting together the training series with her. So um, that's coming soon and available to you all now. So thank you so, so much for being here with us today. It was so amazing to meet you. It would be very fun to have you back at some point. Um, I can tell that we just like barely, barely scratched the surface. So It's a big subject. So by all means, it's a week segment. So Yes. Plenty of stuff to study. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. And thanks to all of you for being here. And thank you so much for making astrology a part of your life. We will see you next Thursday. And again, that the time change is 11 a.m. Pacific, 1 o'clock Eastern. If you want to sign up for live alerts and make sure that you know every time that we go live, you can do so. And the link for, for that is in the chat and also in the video description. All right. We'll see you next time. Take care.